Good evening. This is Dolores Cannon again with the Metaphysical Hour. And we are live tonight, but every time I say that, I never really know for sure because they always play the archives when I'm not here, and you never know if it's me or if it is a recording. But uh, we're going to do a continuation from last week's show. Last week we had a lot of call-ins, so we don't know what's going to happen tonight. But let me give out the toll-free number in case anyone does want to call in and talk tonight. The toll-free number is 1-888-815-9756. 888-815-9756. Now, last week I was telling you we had just gotten back from our trip. And I did a conference, it was a UFO conference in St. Anne's in England. And uh, after that, I never got to, to tell the rest of the story, but that's, that was fine. We had so many interesting people calling in, so if anyone wants to do it tonight, that's fine. That after we left uh, England, we had never been to Ireland, and we thought, St. Anne's is just across the channel from Ireland, across the Irish Sea, so we said, why don't we just go over there for a few days and just see what it was like. So we went on to Dublin, and it was very interesting. And my daughter Julia is here tonight because she goes on a lot of these trips with me, so she can put in her impressions too. But Dublin was a really nice place. The people are very, very friendly. Oh, they go out of their way, it seems oh, like. Yes, <laughs> it was wonderful. We had people we couldn't get in our room at first, and somebody offered to let us stay in her room until her other people got there, and uh, it was like, what? <laughs> 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 you don't know us, and she was just so sweet. <laughs> but we had a mix-up with the reservations, and uh, we couldn't even get into the building at first. Mm -hmm. But the people were so nice. Uh, they... I'm, I think you're nicer than I've ever seen them anywhere. Yeah, I mean, we we meet nice people everywhere we go, but this is this is just your average Joe on the street was just so nice, you know, everywhere. So, but you said you had heard that uh, the Irish yeah. people someone were like in, that. Yeah, someone in England told me we'll love it there because they're so nice, they're so friendly. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they were. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, it's different from being in a big city. Like London is just like New York. Everybody in a hurry, and they're all rush, rush, rush. And yeah, but they were nice there too because we were having trouble with our luggage getting from. We were trying to get on the underground, which was a big mistake. And then we decided we changed our mind, decided to take the taxi to the airport. And wonderful, we had to go back up the stairs with these heavy pieces of luggage. And these wonderful people, these men, just stopped, and they said, here, let me help you. And they, they took everything up the stairs. And then a woman helped take another bag all the way out to the taxi. And it was like, this is so nice. We had angels everywhere on that trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But we were supposed to be on that one. We were supposed to be taking a train direct from Manchester mm -hmm. to Heathrow, yeah. we thought. But that was where the mm -hmm. problem came up. Mm -hmm. It didn't go to Heathrow. It stopped in, um, what was it, in London? Oh, uh, I don't remember. <laughs> I'm going so much. We stopped at this one station, and then mm -hmm. they said the only way to get to Heathrow from here is to go down into the tube. I told Julie before, I don't care for the tube in England because I don't know where I'm going. I'm afraid I'm going to get stuck somewhere. And if you get off, you don't know where you are. Now she understands. We don't <laughs> like the tube. It's like the subway in New York. It's just very, very hectic. But, yeah, the people have always been nice everywhere we've gone. But it's just every city has a different energy. And Dublin was just a very good energy. Yeah, it was a more of a laid-back city, you know. It, it was. It was a very good energy, but it was, it was laid back. It's a city. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a city, but, it's, but it's, yeah, it's relaxed. So. Well, one thing I thought was interesting, right in the middle of the city, after we got off the uh, the bus mm -hmm. and we were going to go find this this hotel that we had trouble getting into, they have a huge spire right in the middle of the city. I've never seen anything like that. Uh, it, you can't call it a statue. It was taller than any of the buildings around. It just shot straight up in the air 
but it looked exactly like a needle. Yeah, I wonder if it was a beacon or something. <laughs> we never could figure out what it, the purpose was of what it was commemorating. It's an antenna. Whatever. I think it had a light on top. It would have had to for the airplane. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we have been to the Space Needle in um, Seattle, but this was different. This was like a real needle, except it was gigantic. But it was just like a regular sewing needle that shot all the way up into the air. It must have been. Five, six stories high or more. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> it was, and I'd never seen anything like that, and I never got a chance to ask anyone, what's the purpose? Must be some kind of a memorial or something. That was right in the middle of Dublin, if we found that. And then we had to go from there to try to find our hotel. But uh, we did take a bus tour because we wanted to see Dublin. It's very unusual for us to have a couple of days and not have to work, not have to be at a lecture, not have to do sessions or do classes, just to have a couple of days just to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) we're not used to that. (laughs) But we took a bus tour of Dublin, and the interesting thing is the Guinness Brewery is right in the middle of Dublin. It's almost as though the whole city is built around the the Guinness uh, Brewery. Mm -hmm. It's big, (laughs) huge buildings, and they're all over the place. And they said, what, it's been there since the 1700s? Yeah, it's a long time. And I'm trying to remember how much each one of those towers, they would hold like 175,000 pints per day or something like that. Of the the, the beer. beer, Yes. Famous for the the Guinness beer. Mm -hmm. But... uh, and unfortunately, we're not beer drinkers, so we didn't really get to enjoy that. <laughs> but I guess if you take a tour, you get a free pint at the end of it, and we didn't. <laughs> but it was uh, it was huge. The buildings were enormous, and the whole city was just built around it. So now we know Dublin and Guinness breweries go together. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that has anything to do with the Guinness Book of Records. Unless it's just the same <laughs> name or something. But it's, it's been there forever. And Julia wanted to do something different. We stopped after the uh, the tour. We went into a restaurant, and they had the traditional Irish stew. Well, I'm making it a point now. If I'm on something, I mean, if I'm in a place, and especially if I've not been there before, I want to start seeing some of their tradition. I want to start see, having their dishes, their see some of their culture, things like that. That way I can experience it. I mean, for going there, why not? Uh-huh. <laughs> so. so she said, well, I've got to have that because they said it's a traditional Irish stew and was made out of lamb. Mm-hmm. So I'm not that uh, adventurous. I don't want to try new things. But... Uh, she got the Yorkshire pudding in England uh-huh. and then the Irish stew in Ireland. Right. It was very, very good. <laughs> it was very warm and comfy. It was very good comfort food. <laughs> <laughs> because we were chilly yeah, that it was, day. Yeah, it was cool that day, so it was good. Okay. But then after that, we had to go back to work, and that's what we had to try to get to Heathrow because we had to go on to Russia. And I want to say something about the airports. Uh, They are doing things in the airports that we don't do in the States. And I don't know if that's eventually going to get over here or not. But the one, well, let's go back to when we were in Africa, the month before we were coming back from Africa, Mm -hmm. and we landed in uh, Australia, wasn't it? We took a direct flight from South Africa to Perth. And as we were landing, they said, talk oh, about the fog. This, this whole uh, swine flu stuff is just really entertaining in all the different countries to see what everybody's doing. But on that one, um, they made an announcement that they would be, there would be, they would be fogging the cabin and, um, you know, and releasing some um, whatever into the air. And if you didn't want it, you know, just cover your, yeah, antiseptic or something and just cover your mouth if you didn't want it you know, to breathe it in and stuff, and sorry for the inconvenience. Well, I'm thinking they're going to, you know, just have something shoot out of the air vents or something. No, the attendants go down the aisle with these spray cans behind them, and they're just spraying, walking ahead of it, and and they go down a couple of times, and it's 
just kind of a fog kind of thing if they're spraying. <laughs> spraying behind them so they wouldn't be breathing it in. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so that was that was interesting. <laughs> yeah. But then we had all the extra searches and things too when we came in from Africa. So I think they they do some different precautions from there. Anyway, so it could have been a different thing. It may not have even been swine flu. It may have been Africa something. Malaria yeah, or something. Exactly. Because that's the first thing they wanted to know if you come in from Africa or South America. Right. Mm-hmm. And then they wanted to know where you were in mm-hmm. Africa. Right. And they would search mm-hmm. the luggage. They were much more. Um, they did a lot more there than they do in the other countries. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But uh, one thing in Russia that we found they don't have over here is when you go through security, they have the x-ray machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, they haven't started that in the States yet. Right. And I think it was there the last couple of yeah. times we've mm-hmm. been there. Yeah. You walk into this, it's like a gl- it's glass, you can see out of it, but it's round and it closes up on you because mm-hmm. your stand. It did. It went around and closed. I think that was just the X-ray going around, maybe. Well, you're standing mm-hmm. inside this, yeah. and it X-rays you. And I know there was a lot of uh, controversy about this having it in the states because people thought it was an invasion of privacy. I don't know how much it shows. No, well, I don't either. But I know it's a lot nicer than stripping down. <laughs> <laughs> you just well, You don't have to take anything off. You just go in it. Yeah, you know, and and I think it's better than being patted down mm-hmm. too. Right, because I got that. Yeah, you the, finally got one. <laughs> the airport, this time. <laughs> and it was very personal uh, pat down uh-huh. too. It's not just putting their hands around you. Yeah, yeah. But it was a woman anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one thing we don't have here. They do have the machines that look in the eye, mm-hmm. and they take pictures of you. I think that's coming back into the States where they take your photograph as you come in. Okay. And they have the other one to look at the retina. Yeah. But we haven't has that. we haven't got to the X ray machines yet that are taking X rays as you go <laughs> through. Yeah, I don't know if it's X rays or if they do in a I guess it'd be whatever the same thing is that they do your things with through the security scan it's a scanner is what it would be. I don't know what they're seeing on their side, but you know. <laughs> so that's something different. Mm-hmm. And they've stopped taking off the shoes. In fact, we didn't have it anywhere except here in the state. Right, right. But yeah. when I used to go to uh, Russia oh, a year or more ago, they would t- have you take off your shoes and they give you these little booties like people wear in the hospitals, the little throwaway mm-hmm. kind. Mm-hmm. And then you walk through. They, you didn't have to walk through with your bare feet or your socks. And then you take them off and throw them in a container. Mm-hmm. Well, now they're not doing that. They stopped all the stuff with the shoes. Nobody's doing the shoes except in the United States. So that makes it go a little faster. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it was really <clears throat> hysterically funny, we thought, when we landed in Moscow this time. This was a new one. This has to do with the swine flu. <laughs> we land, and they said, nobody get out of your seats. Stay in the seats because there's going to be a medical personnel are going to be coming on board and checking to see if anyone has temperatures. Well, they're going to see if there's any signs or uh, symptoms of the swine flu. And it was like, they're going to check your temperature. And And I was thinking, wait a minute, I don't want people taking my temperature. But then they said, well, nobody will touch you. Right. So tell them what happened. (laughs) Oh, this, this woman comes through and she's got... Like a, uh, I'm not even sure what they call it. She, they, I'm sure it's called a temperature gun or something like that. But it's, but it's um, but she just kind of it kind of has a it's scanner. It's of a big, uh, like a big flashlight. So right. It was uh-huh. big. Yeah, it was big, and she would just she would just scan it across the rows and then be watching her screen. Well, when she got past me, I could see her screen, and it had like an infrared. Um, picture on it where I guess if there was a somebody had a fever or, or something it would show up as a hot spot I guess I don't know but she would just just kind of do it in front of you know just go on each row in each area and everything and then she just move on and <laughs> to get at every person yeah. mm-hmm. and <laughs> and I've never heard of that before well that's a new one <laughs> so there again I think Americans would think that's an invasion of privacy <laughs> Well, I mean, they're not touching you, and they're not. I mean, that's each country. It's just like I said, it's different. Each country has their own things that they're doing. Rules and regulations. Huh? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I don't know what they would have done if you would have showed up having a fever. I don't know. Well, I think they said that they might put you in a, I mean, they'd go check you out. So they would probably take you to the side and check you out before they let you in. They might put you in isolation or something until they until they knew for sure what was going on. Quarantine or right. something. Right. Mm-hmm. But here you've just been on this plane with all these people, and if you did have something, you just exposed them all. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I was like, well, <laughs> if it's really that big of a deal. So, <laughs> uh-huh. so anyway... <laughs> We got to Moscow, and then we had to take the train into the city. And I think I've told you that before. It's a lot easier to take the train from the airport than it is to take a car because the traffic jams in Moscow are just horrible, bumper-to-bumper traffic. And the trains are new, and it just takes, what, an hour and a half. Right. Well, no, it, wasn't. it was like 45 minutes. This was an express train. It was, it was quick. So. To get into the city, Mm -hmm. which you're you're lugging all your luggage around, Mm -hmm. just like you do in London when you're getting on and off the trains. But at least it was faster than, they said it could take up as long as six hours Mm -hmm. at the peak time of traffic. Well, we stayed in Moscow, and this was interesting, too. You know, it's interesting when you're in another country, you don't know a word they're saying, you can't read any signs, you're really totally lost. Without our translator, we would have really been in trouble. Mm-hmm. I called her my voice because uh, she was with us all the time, but she wasn't there constantly. No. No, we were without her a lot this time. I yeah. Think more. So we had got us an apartment this time so that we could do cooking. And uh, we had a radio show that wanted to have me for a guest. And they were talking about doing it while we were gone. And I said, but I'm going to be in Russia. And I don't even do my own show when I'm overseas. It's hard with the time zone changes and everything else. And I'd just rather not do it. And that's why we have the archives. This man kept insisting, oh, I want to do it from Russia. (laughs) So that was really funny. He told us the time. We gave him the number for the hotel. Gave him the room mm-hmm. number. Well, the thing is, his wife is from Russia, and she speaks Russian, so she was going to be able to set everything up to make sure it was all okay. Yeah. So all of that was, you know, great. And <laughs> It didn't turn out like that. We were sitting there waiting, and the phone didn't ring, and it didn't ring. And then finally it was your... My cell phone. Her mm-hmm. cell phone <laughs> rang. And you know what cell phones are. Here we are halfway around the world, and the cell phone's ringing, and he was saying he couldn't get through. He said every time they called, they kept saying an illegal language. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they meant by illegal language, because they were speaking in English. And then he tried it again, his wife tried it, and they said they were not allowed to call the room. Right. Yeah, they kept trying it as we were doing the show on the cell phone, and then finally, that's what they came through. They said, finally, that you you couldn't, I guess an English call could not go through to the room is what I'm guessing it was what they were saying. <laughs> it so, had to be in Russian. Mm-hmm. Anything else is an illegal language. I guess. So it makes me wonder if they don't monitor the phone calls. Because <laughs> uh-huh. so. I'd never heard that before. Well, here we are doing our show on the cell phone. Boy, I said, ching, at, cha-ching, 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 <laughs> dollars. Yeah. I said, we're dreading to see our telephone bill when it comes. Mm-hmm. You do an hour on the cell phone, and you think it's about $5 a minute. Yeah. That's on the the, the discount plan, <laughs> the international <laughs> plan. <laughs> so we were thinking, oh, that's going to be a big telephone bill when that comes. But we did it over there, and it was so funny. He kept saying, live from Moscow. Mm -hmm. We have the CEO of Ozark Mountain Publishing live from Moscow. And I was thinking, okay, but it's an expensive call. (laughs) And uh, it kept fading in and out. That's why, you know, there was problems with it. That's why on this show we don't let people use cell phones because they said they're not as reliable. And BBS doesn't like to use them, and the other shows we've been on don't like to use no. the cell phones. But it, we finished the show, but it's going to be a big telephone bill. But that's one of the reasons why I don't do it overseas while we're traveling. 
it's just too hard to set it up with the time difference and everything else. So that was another interesting experience. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> then because we had an apartment, this time we were going to do our own shopping to, uh, <laughs> to get our food so we could eat there. And during these few days, we didn't have our translator. We were on our own. <laughs> and that was interesting. The stores... Uh, they may have somewhere in Moscow, they may have a supermarket like we yeah, have. I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, everything we've seen so far is like what we saw. They're just, really? it, everything's divided up into small areas, and they have, they're kind of a specialty. They just have one kind of thing in each area. And then the store, this store, this might be their version of a supermarket, but every area, like you have your dairy area, dairy products, and then you have someone right there that you pay for those. And then you go in another room, and that might be your bread and things like that. And you, you, and it's all behind glass. You point to what you want, and they get it for you, and then you pay that person. Then you and, get some meat to mm-hmm. go to another part. Right. It's about the size, not even as big as our little convenience stores. Right. No, it's not. It's not. Mm-mm. But it's all divided up in these little compartments. And everywhere we went in Moscow, they were like that. Mm -hmm. We had one area where it was a shopping area. Yeah, that was like a a shopping mall, kind of strip mall. (laughs) And each one, you had, I mean, tiny little places. You could barely get in. Oh, yeah. And it was like one might be uh, magazines, one might be your fruits, one might be um, like bread, bread. one might be your dairy again, Um, one might be meat. I mean, it was just all very specialized and... That, so you just go down, I guess, go shopping, just go down each one and get your stuff. And They had little uh, store, little bitty things for clothes. Mm-hmm. One had underwear. Uh, one had animal food, cat, pet food. You know, it was cat food. I mean, it was like, yeah. <laughs> that's all they had. <laughs> so I, I think <laughs> these are what they call kiosks, if that's the right word. I think it's just a little bitty, I don't know, what, like a little... Uh, I'm trying to think of the word. It, it, we don't even have them in the States, not that tiny, mm-hmm. because you could barely get into it. Oh, yeah. And you just walk in, oh. and sometimes it was just a door, and you'd open right there would be the case. That yeah, it, it, what, they might be six feet <laughs> square, <Yeah. laughs> I mean, maybe. <laughs> but I kept wondering how, I mean, if that was each of those people's shops, when they're that specialized, I mean... I guess eventually you do need all of those products, so maybe they all do get roughly the same amount of business. But, you know, I was just thinking about how our stores do. Over here they have a variety so that you're always going to get, you know, people eventually will use everything. So I just don't know. It makes me wonder, those people own those shops or do they? Yeah, I think they do. I think I've read about it. Each one owns that little bitty six-foot uh, area. But you just wonder, I mean, if it, if you don't have a popular item, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just... the, the one next to the hotel was a little bit bigger, like a small convenience store, uh-huh. but it still had these little compartments inside the right. store. Uh-huh. And <laughs> this is where you really feel lost. You can't read the signs. The people don't know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of body language, and we were a lot of the products had pictures on it, and that's about the only thing we could go by. Mm -hmm. Looking at the picture, thinking, I think this is cheese. I think this Mm -hmm. is milk. Right. I think we did pretty good, really, for our first time. We only got two items wrong. (laughs) You know, I mean, out of how many did we get? Probably 15 or something like that. We got enough food for about a week, Mm -hmm. and we kept going Mm -hmm. back. And we were doing a lot of sign language, trying to tell them what we wanted. Right, but where we messed up, we thought we were getting milk, and it actually was a liquid yogurt. And uh, and we made it work. We used it. And then the other thing, we thought we were getting yogurt, and it was like a jello Jello. kind of thing. (laughs) <laughs> so we went back the next day. It's like, okay, I remember seeing something on top that had cows on it, but it was outside of the case. And so that couldn't be right. It wasn't in the refrigerated case. And so we went back, and I'm I'm asking the person, do you have milk? And she's like, what? You know, couldn't have said, I was like, milk, you know, moo, moo. And she, what? <laughs> and I'm trying to even, I was starting to do like you're milking a cow. And then I looked over at the cart that had the cows on it, and I lifted it. 
and realized it was empty. It was for display, and I'm like, that, that's got to be milk. And she's like, oh, Milaka, Milaka. I'm like, okay, Milaka. <laughs> so, everybody, milk is Milaka. <laughs> So then we got milk, and we also found the yogurt. <laughs> we found the yogurt, but it not, looked like Danya and all that. Yes, it. yes. So you, had, we were... you just have to look very carefully at the pictures and because <laughs> so, it's all there. You just have to look. <laughs> and uh, Julie wanted tea bags. We was trying to talk about that. Now, how do you describe what a tea bag is to somebody or what tea is? Mm-hmm. You couldn't see any of you making all kinds of motions. Uh, they had some paper cup, cups, so I took the cup and I was making the motions of pouring water in it and dunking a um, tea bag. After a, a little while, yeah. she mm-hmm. finally got the idea. She called it chai. Chai. Yeah, and, and that's my favorite kind of tea is chai tea. So I guess maybe that's, I don't know if that's what they call tea or if that's, just, she just knew that that kind. So. And said, yeah, yeah, she goes then, over. Yeah, there's a whole wall of it. <laughs> And Lipton, yeah. yeah, now we know Now we know we have tea bags. Yeah. But it's an adventure. Mm-hmm. Uh, at least you know cheese and, and ham and things like that look pretty much like what you're looking for. Well, it all does. You just, it's just a different way. And when you can't, li- you know, touch it, it's all behind glass. You have to point at it, and you just have to do it differently. You yeah. can't really study it, so... But yeah. it's, it's an adventure. Yeah. That's one of the things about traveling, especially when you can't understand the language and you can't read any signs at all. Uh, Julie was getting pretty good. She was beginning to figure out what some of the letters meant and put some of the signs together. So that's the beginning. Yes. Uh-huh. You said you wanted to begin yeah. to learn the letters. That's anyway. right. Well, that's what I said. I was going to start learning how to read it, and I didn't do a very good job of studying it before we left. So the situation came up again, and we're faced with menus, and it's like, well, you know, I could pick out a few letters that I knew it had to be, and so I just started doing that, playing with it a little bit, and then our translator, I kept asking her, you know, different things. It was starting to fall into place, and so then it was like, okay, this is making some sense, and then I just actually started writing it down, what I remember, all the letters and stuff, and so every sign we saw, we just kept looking at it, and it's okay, could it be this, could it be this, and then... Most of the time, it was right. Because <laughs> so. it's the Cyrillic alphabet, not at all like the the one that we use. But uh, we were on our own, like I said, for two or three days, and we'd mm-hmm. go in the restaurant, and uh, <laughs> I mean, the the menu was gobbledygook. But the <laughs> the one waitress came over. Uh, she, I think she was like, might have been like the uh, what do you want to call it, the one in charge. The mayor, dear, the owner. I yeah, mean, the she owner. was she was in charge. That's for sure. And she came over, and we always ask English, and usually people shake their head no. This time, she said yes. A little, uh huh. And Julie said, "Thank you, thank you." Hell, <laughs> we don't know what we're getting. And she asked her about the food. Well, the the lady kept it simple. She didn't know a lot of English. Yeah. She kept it simple. She said. Chicken, fish, yeah. or beef? Yeah, chicken, fish, or meat, I think she called it. And then she so okay, and then she was like, uh, potatoes? Uh, yeah, okay. Salad? Yeah. And she brought us out a very nice meal. Well, then when we had our translator with us with, later, we found out they have all kinds of stuff in there. I don't know where she came up with that because it was a wonderful meal. We were trying to duplicate it later. I think she just she was trying to keep it easy for us. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a great meal. <laughs> because the menu was full of things, but you couldn't, uh, we didn't know what it was saying. So anyway, it's part of the fun of traveling. We're, mm-hmm. We have an experience everywhere we go. <laughs> okay. Yep. Oh. <laughs> uh, but there's a few things I didn't like. We had this huge building that we were in where we had the class and the, the lectures. Right. And uh, believe me, the toilets leave a lot to be desired. <laughs> we are very spoiled in America. Just a little. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't be surprised at the things we take for granted that they just don't have in other countries. Now, I know they're probably worse in other countries, too. They are, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to say it put Mm -hmm. Russia down. In the airports, they had good toilets. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, anything like that. It was just... But this (coughs) this building, uh, they don't have toilet paper, and they don't have any way to draw your hands after you wash your hands. Mm -hmm. 
no, we are so used to these air dryers or something. You know, they don't want to have paper towels and they don't want to have cloth towels. They usually have the air dryers. And I was in there one time. A week got to where we started carrying a little roll of toilet paper in our purse. And I bet that's what other people do, too, because yeah. they know. Because everybody's response to everything was, well, it's Russia. That was what I was yeah, going to say. it's Russia. <laughs> uh, there was washing my hands, and I think, you know, and the lady said, you just shake them off. She was making the motions, just shake it off. And I said, well, if you have a dryer or something, she said, it's Russia. <laughs> it's <laughs> Russia. <laughs> the government doesn't have enough money. <laughs> yeah, to provide paper. Yes, I, I imagine everybody brings their own and stuff. They know. They know their situation. But mm-hmm. it's, uh, anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> we get very spoiled. Well, that's how it was when I went that long ago, when I went over that area. That was the thing I noticed the most were the restrooms, you know, and I was just, it was like, the worst restroom in America is not, is not you know, it's that, better than, than some of these. So that was what I went that to. That was uh, Turkey, wasn't it? Yeah, and actually it was going across um, uh, Europe through the, um, what was then, you know, it was like uh, Yugoslavia and all those countries to Turkey. So but it they, was going. They were still um, under communist yes, at that uh-huh. time. So it was getting, yeah. <laughs> and that's like I'm saying, oh, we, you know, yeah, it really makes you appreciate our country. And it's probably, I mean, I'm sure that, because that, that was 20 years ago, so I'm sure there's differences, but it's, some of these things are still the same. In fact, the toilet paper we had in Russia was the same toilet paper I had in the nice hotel in Turkey. So it was like, this is, that's what they have over there, mm-hmm. you know? It's, it's, it's rough stuff. Yeah, <laughs> so. it's like they don't spend a lot of money on luxuries. Mm-mm. So people out there appreciate what you've got. Even the littlest things are luxuries in these countries. They just don't have them. Well, one thing I noticed, if you don't mind me interjecting this, is something ahead. I've been thinking about, and I guess it's it's the karma of Russia maybe, but it's something I noticed more on this trip. I know it was there before, but I, I, I think we're there enough now where we're seeing something else. It's almost like this... Um, um, What's the word? Uh, it's like this. It's not poverty, but it's almost like they don't feel like they they deserve to have to have like they deserve to be wealthy or they deserve to be. Better it's things. almost it's almost like they they are poor and this is their lot in life. This is their. It's almost like this is this country. This is who we are. We suffer. It was like that kind of a thing, you know, feeling. Yeah. And this is this is you but, know we all we all just rather like yeah you know, take it. You know, one thing, it's, it's, they, they appreciate what they have, but it's also like, I don't know that they, I don't know. I mean, I thought their people have things, but yeah, it's just the, kind of a feeling of... No, I don't um, want, we don't want to get the impression know. that they are poor because no, that's they're not. been propaganda no, for many years that they were very poor in Russia, but they're not. They have cars, they have very nice clothes, mm-hmm. beautiful clothes. Mm-hmm. They have things, but, but see, they keep making things. Well, but Russia's poor. Russia's poor. It can't do these things and stuff. And so it's almost like they've been this whole general mentality mentality of Russia's poor, and this is just who we are, and this is how we are. And so it's almost like they don't expect things or something because I, I, it's kind of an undercurrent of, of something. I, well, they they live in apartments. They I don't think anybody would live in a house. We only saw some houses when we, we, were, went out. Mm-hmm. we were on the way to the airport, way, way outside of Moscow. Mm-hmm. So they all live in apartments. They don't have a lot of room. Mm-hmm. That's what no. Julie said when we got back. It was like, finally, here we got room. They don't expect to have room. No. But then I think that that's general for a lot of cities, period. Oh, yeah. You know, you get used to, that's just one of the things you give up. To, to be in the city because usually you can make more in the city, and so you give up that that luxury of space. You know, well, it's like that in New York, right? Yeah, any of your big cities. London. Usually, when you're right in them, that's the way it is. Yeah. When I was in Kiev in um, Ukraine too, they live in these apartments. It's all there is is like in Moscow, blocks and blocks of huge, tall apartment buildings, and that's where people live. But yeah, well, we got to remember too, they were under the communist rule the strict communist rule for so many years that they mm-hmm. didn't have anything. Right, right. So they just got used yeah. to not having it. Right. So they probably figured this is the way it is. Exactly. That's what I meant. It was like that's the feeling it was. 
And there's some, I mean, it's just, they're, they're moving, they're waking up and they're moving. It's just, it's a small percentage of them they're doing it, so it's not got a, a big effect yet. You can, it, it, it'll come. It's just, it, it's just like we're in this group that, you know, that are forward thinkers or whatever, you know, they're, they're a different consciousness, but then you look around and you can feel it. It's this, this other thought, this other feeling there, so. That's what our translator said the last mm-hmm. time we were there. She said, why does everybody keep saying Russia wants to take over the world? She said, we got enough problems with our, our own country, mm-hmm. our own infrastructure. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. needs work. Mm-hmm. She said, we don't have the money or the inclination to take over the world. we got to fix our mm-hmm. own country. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it's, a, it's an interesting place. But people are wonderful everywhere uh-huh. we go. People are people, yeah. no matter where we go. Yeah, no matter what language they speak or what they look like, they're wonderful. And sometimes when I'm speaking before an audience, even if it is in a country using a translator, they all look alike. You don't know where you are until they open their mouth and talk. Then it's either a foreign language or it's an accent that right. we're trying to figure out. <laughs> I had one more thing I wanted to talk about, the Wheel of Fortune. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> they have the Wheel of Fortune in in Russia, but it is not anything like the Wheel of Fortune here. And I think most of you know that TV show, the way it is here. And we give away so much money. Mm-hmm. Now, we watched that. We were eating um, eating dinner at the restaurant. It was mm-hmm. on the TV. Right. And our, it was an hour show, and we were there probably about an hour. And our translator was telling us what it was. And during that hour, they solved two one-word puzzles. Mm-hmm. That was all they did. Mm-hmm. It took them that long. But because it was more of a amateur hour. Mm-hmm. It was hysterical. I, they said, it's just a, yeah, it's just where people can get up and have... There are 15 minutes of fame, I guess, and they can they do sing, you know, recite poetry, sing a song. Well, that one woman was in native Russian uh, attire and did something. I don't know what she was doing, but come out and do their dance. And the prizes they were bringing them out. They come from all the different villages in Russia, and they make things, mm-hmm, handcrafted mm-hmm. things, and they bring them out and they put them on this big table. Mm-hmm all kinds of uh, handicrafts and from different villages, and they donate these for the prizes. Mm-hmm. And they would give the prize for the, the winner of the little mm-hmm. the song and dance or the poetry. They had little kids up there mm-hmm. even. And that's what they said. Most of them, that's what they did. They'd bring their little grandchildren or nieces, nephews, whatever, and then they'd let them do a lot of things, and that would be it. They, they said the people love it. <laughs> they win the prizes. <laughs> Of course, to us, yet, I don't think it would ever go here. It was very amateurish, but it was just so funny. They're doing that, and then they come up with a wheel of fortune, just like they have here, and they have one word, mm-hmm. and like they would pick one letter. Mm-hmm. Then they'd go on to some mm-hmm. more amateur stuff then after a little while, and yeah. then 15 minutes, they pick another letter. I never did see them solve it, but I'm sure they did. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. And I don't know what the prize would have been for that. But during the whole hour, they only had two one-word puzzles. And the rest was just people getting up there and, like you said, having their 15 minutes of fame. It was was very interesting. I think she said they also have um, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Who knows what that was like? (laughs) No, we didn't see that one. I doubt if they'd ever get to the millionaire. Yeah, we did see on their TV um, what looked like it might be um, like, who you know, Russia's Got Talent or something like that. Oh, that yeah. was different. It was boy. <laughs> uh, yeah. And we couldn't understand them, so we don't know how the rules were. They had judges. I so could tell that. But, <laughs> but it was very amateurish compared to uh-huh. ours anyway. Uh-huh. But they had their mm-hmm. other shows. They had their detective shows and things mm-hmm. like that. They, they do like American TV, but they but they dub over it. You can't find anything. You know, a lot of other countries you can find, or especially in here even, you can find some stations will broadcast in another language. You know, so that way if somebody's here, they can at least get something. Over there, no, everything's in Russian, and you can't. So it's like, and they're dubbing over. You'll be watching an American movie, and. 
if their Deborah is late, that's great because you heard a few words in English, but otherwise it's over it and it gives you a headache to listen to both of them. <laughs> You're, and so, uh, the, minute, the minute we get off that plane, I said our brains are really fuddled the whole time we're over there because it's just nothing to relate to. But in the other countries, oh, American TV is, is big everywhere. Right, yeah. And who is that? Two and a half men. Yeah, that is popular everywhere. everywhere. That's on everywhere. And then Friends, of course, is always everywhere. And this was in in mm-hmm. South Africa and and England and in said, Ireland. My, it's everywhere. Mm-hmm. I said, my gosh, that show is everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> two and a half men. <laughs> so I guess they think a lot of that show. But we couldn't keep up on the news because we couldn't see what was going on. <laughs> Well, and if we did see news, they weren't talking about America for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> talking about their country. <laughs> so I said, when we're on those kind of trips, I said anything could happen, and we wouldn't know about it till we got back to an English-speaking well, country. I'm sure somebody would call us and let us know if it was anything really major. <laughs> so. If they would let you get a call to your room, you'd have well, to use your cell phone. Well, yeah, and that's the phone that everybody knows. <laughs> I mean, that's how we're reached is by our cell phone. So. <laughs> you were trying to get on internet. Oh my goodness! That That's... was that was comical. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be free internet. Yeah, we checked the hotel out before we left, and it said it had high speed internet in the office. Well, no, we didn't, didn't say it was free. I mean, I expected to pay for it, but, this but I expected to have some. <laughs> this was on the website. We found the hotel. Yes, yeah, it said they had it in their business center. They had. High speed internet, and it's like wonderful. I can get some work done. So I was saving all of my internet work till I got there, because I was having a hard time finding all I could find were internet cafes and and things. And so that's short term use. You can check your emails, but so we get to the hotel and they're doing remodeling. Mm-hmm. Well, that was fine. I mean, the room was very nice and everything, and and it wasn't inconvenient to you know it wasn't bad where they were doing it. But then when I asked about getting the internet, they were like, "Oh no, the remo- you know they with hand- sign language, there's sign- you know the remodeling, they don't have it." And it's like you know, yeah, like okay, great. <laughs> I was like, "Your brochure? No, no." <laughs> but that one day they did let you check. Ah, somebody's calling in. Okay, they did let her check her emails one day. Okay, somebody there. Yes. Hello? Good evening, lady. Okay. Hi, ladies. Yeah, we're doing a travel Hi, log tonight. Go ahead. Well, my, yeah, this is Dale. You, you say you weren't taking any calls tonight? Well, yeah, if, if somebody wants to call in, we're willing to talk. Okay, well, I, I've been listening to your travels in Russian. It's, it's been very <laughs> interesting. I, th- my name's Dale. I called you last week. I was real excited because I just discovered this new me that I, you know, that I heard you the day before. Uh, yeah. Coast to coast, George Norrie. I I came yeah. up with a couple of questions, and I and it's not really been bothering me, but it's uh, something I I wanted to ask you. You said you've spoken with Nostradamus on on many occasions, correct? I wrote three books on it. We okay. interpreted all of the 1,000 quatrains, the prophecies. Well, and I haven't three read volumes. your work, but I am getting around to ordering some books. i got two questions for you. The first one is, regarding dimensions, do they overlap at times? Definitely. They say you're in and, and out of these different... What? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you are, they say you are in and out of these different dimensions constantly because they are around you all the time, and they do. They merge together, and they do overlap, and some people go in and out of them and don't even realize that. In my last book, or was it, or was it convoluted too, where I have about dimensions? Because after I've done a show, especially like Coast to Coast or Art Bell, we got so many hundreds and hundreds of emails people talking about dimensions and the things that they've noticed, uh, you don't usually notice that you're moving in and out of them unless something happens to get your attention, that something is out of place that shouldn't be there. Then you know you have gone into another dimension. Uh, 
Oh, oh yeah, ladies, but otherwise, ladies, I, I think you've hit a struck a nerve with me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I have many, many examples that I use in my lectures and I talk about in the books of people going in and out of these without even realizing it. Well, like, for instance, if you were walking down a street and you saw a very beautiful tree on the other side of the street and you'd noticed it and you said, boy, that tree is beautiful, maybe the next day you walk by and there's no tree there. That means it existed in the one dimension and it doesn't exist in the other. Little things like that that may get your attention. Whereas if you have you ever known... Know? Have you ever known anyone that has been trapped in one dimension? Where, Because like, I understand there's many, many, many of me in all these dimensions. And how in the world are we never, I mean, if how do we keep from bumping into each other? And the second part of that is I kind of feel like I'm trapped in an alternate dimension, and I'll explain that in a moment, but I'll let you respond. You will never bump into yourself because it can't happen. Because if you okay. did that, the matrix would be destroyed. Now, this is in my book, uh, The Legend of Starcraft. It talks about that you might see yourself. Some people have talked about seeing their doubles and things like that. But you would never have contact with the other one because if you did, the matrix would be destroyed and it couldn't exist. They can't exist in the same place at the same time. But yes, you do have many other yous that are going off and doing many different things. This is also in one of my books I talk about this. It would be one of the convolutes again with the parallel universes and things like that. And the like splitting, that. the splitting uh -huh. off to where you uh -huh. are existing in many different lives all uh -huh. at one time. See, a lot of this can get very uh, complicated. Well, here, here's ahead. something that happened to me, and then it just it's driving me crazy because I, I really don't feel like I can really ex tell anybody about this other than you because you're the, you seem to be the closest person that can actually understand what it is that I felt I went through several years yeah. ago when I was an over the road truck driver down in Pensacola, Florida. They have a local television station, it's like everyone does. And they have this super Doppler radar that's darn near at road grade level. I mean, it sits up on a tower, but it's a really, really low tower. It was in the fall. It was at night. It was late at night. It had just rained. And there was a slight fog that was emanating off of the worn pavement. The air was cool and the ground was warm. And fog. There was some, and I wasn't too far away from this Doppler radar, and I, I kind of think maybe it played into into it. Maybe it didn't, but it, it, it felt that there was a car that went by me. There was a car that went by me, and it, it was a red sedan, four-door sedan. The person lit a cigarette in a certain fashion, and the car was just barely out of sight, and all of a sudden, here comes another car, and suddenly, it was the same car, the same person, lit the same cigarette in the same fashion, and my head about came off my shoulders, and, and it, sh it literally floored me, and it shook me to my core, but I can't drive it. What was that? Okay, I've heard these stories many, many times. <laughs> Some people say they're driving down the freeway, go under an overpass, and then a minute later they're going under the same overpass again, almost as though it's repeating itself, and that's what you were having yeah. happen there. And that's like that time I was telling you about my daughter coming into the room at night. She came in, and she was like, I can't remember. She, she didn't feel good. She hurt herself something, and she came in, and I was like, okay, and then... I I thought, I, then the next thing I know, she's coming in the room and telling me this. I'm like, well, wait a minute, you just told me that. Didn't you just, and she's like, what? And and she had just come in once. And so I kept thinking, was it like a moment that repeated itself or something? Yeah, or? <laughs> because, you know, thing, there is no such thing as time anyway. Uh, we know that okay. time is an illusion. 
the ETs say mankind is probably the only species in the universe that found a way to measure something that doesn't exist. So sometimes things will do that. It's almost like deja vu. It's the same kind of a thing of repeating. It's. I think it's kind of like a track that skips and just does it yeah. again. Yeah, like um, well, let me throw one. Um, let me throw one more at you here because this is really going to kind of. This has always floored me. Yeah. Now I grew up in. I grew up all through, you know, elementary school learning about animals. You know, the animals of the sea, animals of the desert, yada yada yada. In the universe that I grew up in, sperm whales were non-existent. They were ex. The only thing roaming the oceans when I was a kid was the blue whale. Yeah. I don't know when and how this occurred, but now I'm stuck in it. I feel like I've, I'm stuck here in this universe, and I'm finding that the sperm whale exists, and it's the blue whale that was extinct, or we thought that was extinct. I thought I'd been losing my mind. I knew I was dropped on my head when I was a kid. Somewhere. Yeah, I'm like, okay, explain that. What's uh-huh. going on? Well, I've written about these things. My book is called The Legend of Star Crash. The man, he was a hunter, and he shifted dimension. Didn't know what he didn't know it, but he had found an animal that didn't exist anywhere. It was totally unknown, and he brought it back to the village to be, uh, and they ate it, so it had to be real, but it didn't exist anywhere, and it talks in that book about going in and out of dimensions and how some, t- some of these dimensions have things in them that do not exist in our own. Uh, no, you're, you're perfectly sane, because I tell you, I, I see thousands and thousands of people, and I hear these things all the time. And they're all worried about being normal. I told them, I guess oh, it's about as normal as you can get. It's the other people that are not, I guess, because... I think they're sleepwalking. The they're, they're sleepwalking <laughs> yeah. because there is so much going on the average person hasn't got a clue of. Well, see all this the, stuff that happens in my I think conscience. it's kind of like, a, um, rather than skipping, I think it'd be like... I'm trying to think of what happens like when you something repeats. It's like a record that gets stuck in a in a groove, in a groove or something. Like and it, yeah, record. I think it's something like that where you're on a track and it just mm-hmm. keeps repeating that track or something. Yeah. Um, now, do but, these uh, portholes well, in the dimensions are that are the portholes in are they a part of this dimensional shift? Do I get caught? Is that what that was that I got caught up with that night on on the road outside of Pensacola? Did I enter a porthole and exit it just that quick? Porthole. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, right. Portal, you're talking about portals. Portals right. are where you can go into other dimensions and time travel. And a window uh, is where you can look through it, but you can't go through it. These are different. Right. All of this is explained in my books, and it gets very complicated. But uh, soon you just begin to figure out that it's perfectly normal. We just we're, we're we're awakening. The veil is lifting, and we're learning more and more now that we d- didn't know before. Okay. Well, I got uh, news for you. The last to week, let you go because we're coming up to when we're going to have to go off the air. Oh, okay, that's right. Thank you very much, ladies, for your time. Uh, but I will be will be gone for two weeks because I'm traveling at conferences. And in the 20th, we'll be back on the air, but I'm going to have guests. But any time you want to call in, just go ahead and do it. You know right, you've got well, other very much. here that don't think you're weird. We're all weird. <laughs> well, I feel but like I I'm not alone anymore. Book, and I'm, I'm, yeah, if you read yes, my I'm book, you're going to find a lot of in them. Okay, Dale, well, let's let you go now. Thank you. All right. Have okay, a good Okay, bye-bye. Okay, uh, before we go off, I do want to mention I will be in the Los Angeles area. Now, this is Sunday, this coming Sunday, November the 1st. We're going to be doing a lecture in uh, Long Beach 
at the Renaissance Hotel in Long Beach. We're going to be doing a lecture, and it's a joint lecture with Blair Styra. And this man is fantastic. He's the the mo most renowned psychic channeler in New Zealand, mm -hmm. and he's very famous over there. And this is his first time in America, and I'm going to introduce him to America. He channels an entity called Tabash, extremely accurate. He's a wonderful person, and he's going to be taking questions from the audience during the lecture. This is the 1st of November, Sunday. At 6.30 p.m. 6.30 at the Renaissance Hotel in Long Beach. And then after that, we'll be going to Burbank. And in Burbank, I'm going to give one of my hypnosis classes. If anybody wants to come and just sign up there, they can do it. This is the Holiday Inn Media Center. Mm -hmm. In Burbank. In Burbank. Mm -hmm. And we'll be there for the whole weekend. It's a three-day class. And uh, in, I teach people my method, and we're teaching this all over the world. So if anybody wants to come to the lecture, uh, you can come for that. And then if you want to take the class, just show up, and you can pay at the door for if that. You, and if you have any questions, you can call our office, and that's 1-800-935-0045. And we can give you more information about both of those. Okay. And then the next week, I'm going to be in Minneapolis. That's the weekend of the 14th. Right. Uh, it's the Edge Life Expo in Minneapolis. I'll be speaking there on the next weekend. So if anybody wants to come there, all this information is also on our website, telling where all these things are. And the website, you want to find out about the books, the classes, the sessions, anything, the schedules. It's www.ozarkmountain, and that's abbreviated, O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. Ozark Mountain, O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. Also, DoloresCannon.com will work. <laughs> okay, so, and mm -hmm. that's all one word. All one it? word, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the number is 1-800-935-0045. And I'll be back here live on the 20th after these two um, conferences. Okay, so it's time to sign off now. Thanks for listening to our travel on tonight. <laughs> All right, and thank you. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed the show, check out more of our other videos, and be sure to subscribe and click the like button. Thank you for listening to the Metaphysical Hour with Dolores Cannon.